start. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CMR Green Day. I'm Federica Bordelo. Can you hear me well? Yes, better like this, maybe. So I'm Federica Bordelo, uh, Director of Policy and Impact at CMR, and I'm really pleased to see you all here in presence, but also online connected for this event. We have around uh, 60 uh, participants uh, today for this uh, for this event, and this I think really uh, great uh, uh, to to see you all but also to this shows also the importance of of this uh, of this topic for all uh, our membership um let me start with a bit of a housekeeping rules uh, especially for those uh, online so please mute yourself if you do not speak keep your camera on whenever available. Uh, the meeting will be recorded. I hope you are all fine with this. Uh, raise hands or write uh, in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, questions from the audience will be addressed in two moments uh, uh, during the debate. So please keep your questions for those two moments and I will give you uh, uh, the floor. So now let's, uh, let's start. Uh, so CMR Green Day, uh, is uh, is a key moment for uh, for us for our membership to uh, discuss on key uh, horizontal issues to foster sustainability in local and regional territories. We do it. Uh, we organize it uh, every every year, once a year. This year, uh, before dedicate some time for the more technical and internal discussions uh, with uh, with our members, we decided to kick off the day with a political open uh, debate on uh, the future of the green transition. The European Green Deal has initiated a surge of regulations spanning from climate, energy, mobility, biodiversity, um, circular economy, and CMR and, and its members actively position uh, uh, themselves as key players uh, in many of the environmental energy and climate uh, uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis the uh, EU institutions, providing key uh, evidences and res recently, for instance, we published the NECP study and final report, which clearly demonstrate the critical role of local and regional governments in energy and, uh, and climate policies. Uh, so this is a copy that you can, that you can also grab uh, uh, outside. Um, and um, uh, so this, this, this report, as I said, uh, clearly demonstrated the critical role of the local and regional governments in energy and climate policy implementation, specifically on the competencies of local and regional governments and the public finance. So because local and regional governments are pivotal in executing this ambitious shift towards sustainability, and with only two months left to the EU, uh, election C CMR really aims to discuss and present uh, recommendations regarding the future of the green transition and uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, its associated challenges and opportunities within the territories. To support the debate today, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Mr. Tadashi Matsumoto, who is head of the National Urban Policy and Climate Resilience Unit at OECD, who will present to us the latest uh, report on a territorial approach to climate action and uh, and resilience. So please, Mr. Matsumoto, the floor is yours. If you want to come here, I give you. Thank you very much, Federica, and uh, welcome uh, and uh, uh, good morning to all. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation to, to this uh, uh, important event, uh, Green Day. Um, and I'm pleased to um, present this new OECD report on the territorial approach to climate action and resilience, uh, which we launched at the COP28 in Dubai last December. Um, and uh, if I say one word with, on this report, it's, it's addressing the urgent needs of linking uh, national climate to climate um, uh, commitment uh, to local action. So this is what uh, the, the report is about. Um, and um, it makes uh, a clear business case. So actually the report is for na both national and local government, but we have an emphasis on the action of national government so, so, so that uh, we, we will be uh, in the report making uh, a clear business case for national government 
to integrate a place-based approach to uh, uh, their climate strategies if uh, they want to deliver on uh, their national commitment uh, we need a local government so that's a key message in the report um, I've come to the slide very uh, soon just to make uh, these three points before going into the report so the first of all the subnational governments are key players in the OECD we use this number quite a lot the the local government subnational government accounts on average for 96 uh, sorry 69 percent of the climate significant uh, uh, expenditure uh, second cities have direct powers to cut up to one third of greenhouse gas urban emissions with remaining two thirds uh, depending on actions where competence are shared with upper levels of government. So that that's, uh, signifies the, the uh, coordination across levels of government. And then third, a one size fits all approach doesn't work. So again, cities and regions are facing uh, different challenges and it has to take different actions in the face of climate change. So let's go to the slide. Um, the first slide is showing uh, uh, one of the two data that I'm going to present today. So to, to present the wide disparities in the progress of uh, um, net zero across cities and regions. If you look at this chart, uh, we can see strikingly different profiles of emissions um, between different cities in the OECD. Um, I can just flag, uh, you know, let's say uh, Miami from the United States having a large fossil fuel power sector, uh, so which accounts for half of the, their emission, emission. If you look at, if you find Montreal, I don't know if you can find it, uh, you see the big purple in, in, in between inside, then uh, you know, they are showing uh, the emissions are coming mainly from the, from the industry sector, more than 50%. Our data also shows that 40% uh, of OECD metropolitan areas with more than 500,000 populations are kind of consistent. If you see the red line um, in the graph, which is the uh, consistent with uh, IEA scenario of reaching net zero uh, in 2050. So 40% of these OECD metro areas are somehow uh, in, in, in the line, aligning with, with that, meaning 60% is not there. And then also, if you look at regions, then regions are much more in, in a challenging condition because cities have a, you know, more population and then more density. So per capita uh, emissions are lower compared with, with regions. The next slide uh, is showing uh, another example of territorial disparities. Uh, this time in terms of climate impact. And um, the, in this case, we are showing um, uh, urban heat island. Then uh, the point we want to make is that the problem is significantly more challenging in the, in the large cities. But you see uh, different colors and dots um, showing uh, the, uh, their, their, um, their risks or they are actually increasing in temp temperature um, in, a, in, a, in, in a city center. So in some, pla some places you see uh, on average three degrees, three, three degrees uh, warmer in city center compared with their surroundings in, in cities. And uh, th this uh, phenomenon is, is bigger in, uh, in a large cities. For example, uh, in uh, smaller cities, uh, with less than uh, 100,000 uh, inhabitants, the uh, this difference between city center and then surroundings is like 1.5 degrees. But the larger cities, you see like three degrees difference. Um, next slide is showing actually um, the our key findings of our summary of of, of key challenges in terms of the the, the rationale for a, a place-based approach. Um, we, we, we summarize it in four. The first one is that uh, national governments 
have been um, taking a, a rather sectoral approach still uh, when dealing with climate policy, focusing on key, act, key sectors, well, let's say uh, energy or transport. But this is often space, space blind or spatially blind and uh, sectoral focus on the policy. Uh, this is a missed opportunity because um, adapting a territorial approach can help um, to reconcile different objectives in, in, you know, specific to the location, better address trade-offs and then create synergies. Second item we want to highlight is a data gap. Um, so there's poor understanding of local conditions mainly coming from the data gap in many countries, which hinders the tailored local action at national level. Um, third, a lot of attention is being put for local government who are making, who had, have made uh, ambitious uh, commitments already. But in reality is that the majority have not making that levels of commitment uh, because of lack of um, awareness or, or knowledge or political uh, buy-in at a local level. So actually, um, if not all the subnational governments are making this uh, green transition journey, um, national objective will not be will not be achieved. The last point is really linked to the third point. Um, it's related to the local capacity. Um, so many local governments struggle to translate their um, declared ambitions because many cities are you know, already committed or declared their carbon neutrality goals and so on, but uh, you know, translate it into concrete um, climate action and measures. And here, you know, this gap coming from, comes from limited resources or inadequate guidance, or sometimes uh, our, uh, our perceived rigidity of, of policy frameworks. So, um, coming to, to the next slide, uh, we come to the um, Takao report structure. Uh, we call it Takao, Territorial Approach to Climate Action and Resilience. So, we have this threefold structure. The first part is an is a indicator, second and third part, you see um, policy checklist and leading practices. So, I just uh, walk you through very quickly to the um, uh, key elements of the report. So next slide is showing um, the, the indicators. So the framework, uh, you see 45 indicators here. Um, this builds on the existing framework of uh, OECD. It works especially uh, the indicators uh, that are developed at the national level. Um, we have IPAC, it's an you know, OECD-wide initiative which uh, has a, a dashboard for climate performance. And then we try to um, make our indicators as consistent as possible, because one of, the, one of the objectives of this indicator, particularly, is to measure local actions with the same measurement with the national government, that the national government has. So this is what is missing in, in our understanding. You know, there are many, many local or regional indicators and you know monitoring frameworks, but you don't see a lot of things which are really consistent and comparable with what national government is doing. So this is what uh, we, we try to do. Um, we cover uh, OECD metropolitan areas. So we have uh, 1,200 metro areas, and then also uh, more than um, 2,800 regions in the OECD and then database is already there. So you can compare uh, across regions and cities. Um, we have on the left-hand side, you see mitigation uh, level indicators. On the right-hand side, you see adaptation. And on the bottom, you see the indicators of actions, like how local governments are acting uh, or levels of green innovation and so on. It's related to, to actions. So with these indicators, next slide is showing how, you know, one way of, uh, of using it. Um, this is an example of Bratislava and then also New York State. So this is a city level and then the other one is a regional level. 
and uh, we just you know it's a selected indicator so you can make a bigger uh, you know web chart based on our indicators but this you know can tell um, which areas of of climate action is more advanced than others compared with um, with uh, with the global other other cities so if you are close to the the circle the outer circle um, this basically means uh, you are a top runner out of 800 cities in the OECD countries and if you're close to the center you are uh, not, not that big, not that advanced you see so that that's how how you see it um, so I come to this you know in a discussion but uh, what what is useful for cities is that you compare with other cities and then you identify you know your strengths and then weakness but also you can find a, a similar city in the world that have a similar type of challenges with you so that you can you know make a contact and then you know learn from them with each other so that you can um, you know find a better or better fit policies yeah i don't go to the details on that but uh just uh, i'm happy to have more discussion on that and the next slide is showing a policy framework so um we came up with these nine policy actions uh, divided into three pillars. This is basically how to implement a territorial approach, how concretely um, to, to, to implement. And then again, this is both for national and local government. So I can go from the pillar one, which is um, basically talking about climate policies so talking to environment directorate or environment uh, ministry uh, starting with monitoring so granular monitoring is one second one is to incorporate local actions within ndc's you know naps and nas and so on that's the second one third one uh, to really accelerate local level climate policy and strategies and uh, with consistency uh, with the national level policies so that part uh, we, are, we are emphasizing uh, pillar two is about um, territorial development policies meaning um, we are talking to urban directorate uh, you know infrastructure people uh, uh, yes uh, uh, transport people and so on so first one to make mainstream climate action into let's say national level urban policies, it's not sometimes yet done. Um, second one is to um, promote climate action at the right territorial scale. So we are particularly focusing on metropolitan scale, but also, you know, uh, depending on sectors, uh, you know, different uh, scales. And then third one, particularly focusing on uh, neighborhood approach, because it is a place where you can create an integrated approach and then also um, co you know, realize co-benefit um, most. Then the third pillar is is a more generic environment or enabling environment, uh, starting with legal and um, political framework, and then second, the finance and funding, and then third, citizen engagement and local uh, action. Yeah, so that's a framework under which we also have a recommendation in the report of sub-national, uh, sorry, sub-action sub uh, under these nine actions, uh, which constitu constitutes basically a policy checklist, you know, so we can, um, you know, e each municipality or national government can use this as a, as a checklist, you know, so this is what also we like to use when we have an opportunity to do uh, country level studies or city-based studies. Okay, um, then finally, based on this, also we have uh, included 36 different approaches of multi-level climate action. This is as a, pra as a best practice for, for uh, inspiration. Final slide is uh, what we are going to do with this report. So we are uh, planning to do several actions, as you see in the um, slide. It's still a kind of rollout plan for us to promote a Takar um, framework. Um, dissemination, uh, this is already an opportunity to disseminate this work. Thank you very much again. 
Um, but we're also thinking of uh, country-based launch events uh, throughout the year. Um, second one is uh, about advancing the Takar uh, indicators. So I showed you we already have 45, but actually there are several points uh, where we like to improve a bit you know, in, in this uh, indicator framework. Particularly, we are trying to measure the distance. As I said, uh, you know, if you see this web map, in the center, it's like not yet. Uh, so if you have if you have a scale, 800 metropolitan areas, this is the most advanced, and then this is the least advanced. But uh, we like to make a more precise understanding of what is this global goal or what is the national goals, and uh, you know how to so that you know we we are really making sure that this you know people are trying to reach this goal. Yeah, so, but we like to articulate a little bit of these indicators. Um, then we have two, three other uh, goals. Um, one is a, a case study that we like to continue to do to apply the framework to give a more concrete you know, support to national and local government. And then looking at a few uh, policy areas, I like to highlight nature positive cities. This is uh, one of the emerging areas. So we like to apply this territorial approach framework to advance nature positive uh, uh, urban development. And then a few others. And then also we, as an OECD, try to um, lead and contribute to the, the global uh, climate agenda throughout the year uh, and, and beyond again. So, that's all for me. Thank you very much. And then next slide is just uh, showing and I summarize some discussion points that is already, I mean, uh, in your in the notes, but I just summarized uh, to guide uh, your discussion. And I'm really hoping that uh, we can make some interesting discussions based on that. Again, thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have a burning question, you can ask. I had also, but I, I leave you the floor. Sorry, my question. What? What? My question was: What is the benefit of having a territorial approach to the monitoring the climate progress and the next steps? Please. Yeah, thank you. It's a big question, but uh, if I try to answer simply, uh, maybe two points. One is uh, it really creates a political dialogue between levels of government. So, for example, if national government only have a sectoral framework, you know, basically you are not talking about the different uh, challenges between uh, across across localities, right? So if you aggregate, let's say, energy sector numbers, you are working with uh, electric companies and, and so on, you don't really see, let's say, existing, uh, you know, let's say heat supply structure, some place are very much advanced in district heating, some of them are not yet, and then, you know, relying on other uh, sectors, uh, other uh, heat pump and uh, other technologies, And but the national government just say, hey, we like to do energy, you know, but you don't really address difference. So, so local governments can really bring this, you know, difference or territorial interest or, uh, or, or challenges to the national government, you know, we have a specific um, conditions which should be somehow uh, reflected in the national planning. So, th you know, this territorial approach concept can create, you know, op more opportunities for this dialogue. S second one is perhaps uh, a more theoretical, but uh, uh, to create a um, more efficient uh, investment. So, uh, with, a, with a limited resource. So, again, uh, in energy is one example. You have uh, energy 
investment plan, you know, which touches upon, let's say, local infra infrastructure. But uh, you want to do at the same time, you know, other investment, let's say green or let's say uh, transport or housing or building. You know, in that case, if you do sector, you know, investment plans and, and then roadmap, perhaps you miss the opportunity to do, do it together. And then this integrated approach is much more uh, cost efficient and then also, you know, getting a political buy-in and then also resource efficient. So, so that's what we are uh, arguing in the report. And then we are also looking for more examples. You know, if you do a locally integrated approach, it creates much better results, you know. So, so that's what we are trying to uh, advocate. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so this, this question was indeed important to understand then uh, uh, in a way how, you know, why, uh, why to use it, you know, and why to have the, this approach. For me, uh, I just wanted to, to ask you a more maybe practical question in the sense, okay, if I'm a, I'm a region, you know, or, or, a, or a city, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mayor. Um, and I would like to use actually this indicator, you know, how practically, I mean, there is a dashboard, I guess, you know, do, do, shall we, I mean, how do we send the data? How can we, can we actually use it, you know, concretely? Yes. So our suggestion uh, is, again, every region almost or, or cities already have an indicator or monitoring framework. Yeah. So we, don't like to create us or replace this, you know, with uh, totally new indicators. But uh, uh, perhaps when you have a next opportunity to revise your your indicators, perhaps you know include some of the, the indicators that we are proposing, and this indicator should be compatible with national government performance. And then also you can measure the same the the performance with other regions surrounding you with the same measure, and then also with OECD regions, right? Th that gives an extra information for you to, uh, to, to position yourself or to, to understand that you are, you know, where you are in, you know, compared with other. So that's one, one thing, you know, so to improve a bit of uh, monitoring. Um, the second thing actually, you know, for city and local regions can do is apply this territorial approach concept. I'm only talking for now the national and local relations, right? But actually, you know, regions are within your region. You have a you know different uh, local context, right? And within your city also, there are territorial aspects. Of course, city centers and suburbs are different. So why don't you you know start? using this territorial approach within your locality so that you can create, let's say, you know, eight different types of uh, sub-regions in your region and then apply territorial indicators. Some of them should be apl applicable for, you know, these sub-regions and then uh, tailor your regional climate policy into this, you know, the locality. So that's also another uh, concept of territorial approach, which is more practical for, for regions and cities. Thank you. So it's really also a methodology, if you like, that you are promoting in a way. So to start thinking in a different way, you know, and start adopting an, a certain actions, you know, towards this goal. Thank you so much. So um, now it's uh, it's a pleasure for me to to introduce uh, the the other panelists, the other speakers that we that we have uh, today with with us. Uh, Patrick uh, Prinsen, uh, first alderman, uh, city of of Mechelen in Belgium, um, Michael uh, Kernet, uh, Mayor of uh, Kimberley, first uh, Vice President of Brit Brittany Regional Council, uh, who is online, uh, uh, Lucian um, Parvulescu, uh, from the Secretary General of the European Commission, uh, the European Green Deal Unit, thank you for joining us, and Pedro Diaz, a Policy Director of Solar Heat uh, Europe. Great, so let's start. I will start uh, with uh, our speaker online. Uh, so, um, Michael uh, Quernet, so um, you 
per the uh, how how uh, uh, I mean the, the, the this presentation and the importance of this new methodology, new approach, uh, and uh, and indeed the importance also of monitoring and measuring, you know, the performances at uh, at uh, subnational as well uh, level. Um, now. Um, I, I would like to, to come to you to look more into this urban rural divide and uh, and understanding because you are you know coming from 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 a region in France you 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 have you know this broad overview you know of the situation really at territorial level what in your view is missing uh, in the green deal from a regional perspective to really counter this growing urban rural uh, uh, divide and uh, apart from the, maybe the more uh, funding financial aspects, so what are, uh, in your views, the other challenges that you would like to, to point out and to really bring forward today? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this one table. I apologize uh, for not being with you uh, today. Uh, this afternoon, I'm accompanying Loïc chenet girard uh, president of the Bietchani region, uh, to the launch of the COP in Brittany. Uh, the regional implementation of the French Green Planning Initiative. Uh, Mr. Matsumoto, uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. Uh, this ecological uh, planning approach uh, is an uh, illustration of the different stages uh, we need uh, to work on. Uh, the European Union uh, is the appropriate level for a common position on climate ecological transition and energy. Uh, with 27 uh, member states, uh, 450 uh, million inhabitants uh, and a single market, uh, we have uh, influence of the international scene. Uh, member states uh, continue to play uh, an important role in implementing strategies, providing funding and transposing uh, European objectives. But uh, it is the cities and regions uh, that can make a real difference on the ground. The Green uh, Deal uh, launched uh, by President van der Leyen and Van Timmermans, uh, even if it still needs uh, to be implemented uh, and extended, uh, has provided uh, the European Union with a framework for achieving our climate objectives and taking account of the consequences of uh, climate change. We, knew, uh, we now so we need uh, to implement these uh, measures uh, on the ground. In this sense, uh, I agree with the idea of the Green Deal going local, put uh, forward uh, by my colleagues in, at the Committee uh, of the Region. Nevertheless, uh, this transition has a social and economic cost. Uh, the report by uh, Jean Pisani Ferry and Selma Mafouz uh, on the economic impact of climate action puts the cost of the transition for France alone at 66 billion euros uh, pay her up to uh, 2030, half uh, of which will have to, uh, to be covered by the, the public sector. However, I'm not making uh, any uh, spectacular announcement uh, when I say that uh, the budgetary context uh, is not in favor of spending. The European Union uh, will have to support the regions uh, by ensuring transition and uh, social cohesion. Uh, give the role of investment uh, waiting to public and private players, the current budgets are uh, not enough. Uh, we need to rethink uh, the European Union's uh, own resources, uh, just as we are uh, rethinking the powers of local uh, authorities. This is the meaning of cohesion policy, to which I'm very attached. Uh, for digital, ecological, and social transition, uh, all three together. I insist um, on this last point of social transition. Uh, I fear that without massive uh, support from the cohesion policy, we will end up uh, with uh, urban centers uh, at the forefront of decarbonization, and at the same time, less developed rural areas that host the infrastructures needed for the transitions without benefits, without benefiting from them. The just transition uh, promoted by the European Commission must uh, be a reality for uh, our regions. 
Uh, there is a wide range of um, funding available, but uh, it's sometimes difficult for local authorities uh, that not have expertise uh, in European fund to access it. Horizon Europe missions, life, etc. European funds, but uh, must be more closely tailored to local authorities in line with the principle of subsidiarity. As a mayor, uh, Vice President of the Region and Secretary General from the, of the French Association uh, of the Council of European uh, Municipalities and Regions, I would advocate that local authorities should remain uh, involved to, uh, in sorry, the implementation of uh, European program in order to implement to Green Deal on the ground. Uh, each member state may retain its own organization but the experience of the French regions as, manage, as managing authorities shows the value, the value of getting closer to the ground. Uh, the recovery and resilience facility uh, to boost the European economy uh, after COVID is a good example. Uh, these funds have uh, been taken up by the member states. This represented uh, 30 billion for France, with objectives similar to those of the cohesion policy, green, social, and digital transition. However, this centralization has had an impact of the management of structural funds by the regions, some of which have had to be terminated in order to avoid projects being financed uh, twice by uh, European funds. This lack of trust in the region has led to um, administrative complexity where uh, simplicity would, would have been needed. Uh, finally, uh, funding is not the only uh, lever for uh, implementing the Green Deal. Uh, we need to make the, the issue uh, discussed at, at a European level more concrete with uh, accessible uh, communication campaigns. Uh, this is one of the issues at, at stake in the European uh, elections uh, in June. Uh, for or against uh, the Green Deal. Uh, involving the public is a key element of acceptability. Uh, the transition must be made with the people. Uh, and uh, we must be, we, uh, sorry, and we must not give the impression that the transition is being decided alone in Brussels or Strasbourg uh, with no link to the regions. This is what uh, the spirit of the conference on the future of Europe, uh, which mobilizes citizens from all uh, over the European Union to propose a Europe that was closer uh, to their concerns. Uh, the Green Deal policies uh, will only be understood and accepted if citizens are involved in the decision-making process. Uh, this must be uh, my priority. And sorry uh, for my poor English, and it's less uh, good in video. Thank you so much. It was actually very clear your your message. So thank you so much. Just to maybe to to summarize, especially the the, the last point. I think it's uh, it's and and I totally <laughs> agree. I think this is really a tendency of moving. I mean, funding are important, but uh, increasing acceptance for for from the population is is really now the probably the turning point you know is is really where we should maybe focus more uh the the attention thank you so much uh for, for for your perspective and your messages now we from france to belgium <laughs> we please uh, uh, patrick princeton uh, deputy mayor of the city of mechelen um could you give us uh, a concrete example of, of a project that uh, uh, you have implemented in your city on addressing climate uh, resilience and, um, and also understanding a bit maybe from your perspective, you know, uh, why a one size fits all approach, uh, it's actually not helping, you know, uh, now at this stage, you know, uh, uh, the, our common, uh, common goal uh, and, and really enhancing this, this transition towards a more sustainable uh, a future in our, in our cities and regions. Please. Thank you that I may be here. Um, I'm not giving one example because that doesn't fit 
you know. <laughs> um, Indeed. I give three examples, eh? concrete examples. In 2021, Mechelen was awarded by the European Green Level City label. Eh? And the reason why we got that label was because we adapt on the local situation and the different challenges that are in Mechelen. Mechelen is a, a little city not far from here, 20 minutes with the train, with the car at this moment, I think an hour. Eh? But uh, <laughs> so that's something I. I want to uh, yeah, say clear, but I give three examples because I think it's crucial of on multiple fronts. First, uh, and a lot of I, I, I connected also on European projects or European uh, money we get huh? also, but very important for our city. Um, the first is wetland for cities. We are restoring our wetlands surrounding the city in collaboration with Naturpunt. Who is Naturpunt? It's the biggest Flemish environmental organization and has many volunteers. These wetlands are very crucial for the protection of our city by maintaining our groundwater levels, absorbing significant amounts of water and carbon emissions during periods of heavy rain and drops, and providing natural air cooling for our city. And we do it with the citizens. Yeah, with the citizens itself. And we have um, a kind of uh, citizen science. We, we give the measure instruments at the citizens. And we have four citizens who now are, are using that and see the, the, the difference, what happened in, in period of extreme drought when it's raining a lot and so on with the temperature and with the groundwater level. And so uh, they become also ambassadors of it. And uh, yeah, I was a little bit surprised of your presentation because we detect already that the difference in our city, it's not a big city, uh, between the city center and the wetlands, the difference in temperature is already five to eight degrees in the summertime. When it's very hot on 10 o'clock in the evening, we see the difference of yeah, six to eight degrees already. So you talked about two, uh, three degrees. But we have a lot of data, so we can, can give it. A second example, um, we have a lot of uh, constructions, uh, large constructions of new new districts and so on in our city because we are growing. We're now with 89,000 uh, people and uh, we are growing towards uh, 100, 110,000 uh, uh, inhabitants uh, because we're living between Brussels and Antwerp. So we are in the, <laughs> one of the dense uh, places in, in Europe. Huh? And, uh, but I, I go to two projects. Uh, we build a new nursing home with more than 100, 200 citizens. And in, in Keerdok, that's near to the water, we build a new city district with, for more than 1,000 residents. Huh? And we are committed to realize it fossil free heating by using uh, geothermal energy and sewage heat recovery from the wastewater collector there. We are also exploring aquathermy from River Dale to meet the heating needs to this new city district to become fossil free. These are all innovative projects that are the result of, result of intensive collaboration with a lot of stakeholders and also with money of the EU to first or all realize a so-called our heat plan. This we built a heat plan with all the stakeholders, but I come back on it on the second question. And this plan tells us how to align the supply and demand of low temperature heat sources with specific needs, because we don't have big uh, industry with a lot of, of, of heat. So we have to, to, to bring the heat from uh, the ground, from the water, from the, the wastewater into the houses eh? and to otherwise we never got the goal to be fossil free in 2050. Um, third example is perhaps not so innovative, but it's very important. Over the past five years, we have already replanted 76,000 trees in our city. We are, I think, already committed to the EU's ambition to plant 3 billion trees by 2030. We undertake this effort not only as a city, but also in collaboration with the people of Mechelen. So, 
annually we we sell them uh, a lot of trees, uh, very cheap, and we we make it possible. They have a, a sh enormous choice for uh, planting trees on their private property. And uh, we have also a tree and forest plan aimed at tripling the number of trees on the city ground. For instance, whenever a tree needs to be cut down because it's ill or it's dead, we plant three new trees in, in place. This approach has this yet already a lot of results. And additionally, we have also the principles, I think you know, the 330-300 principle for our city, ensuring wherever you are, you can see three trees. Wherever you stand in our city, you have you we you, you must see three at least three trees. We are searching, aiming for 30% of our land or to be shaded by trees. And having a park or green space every 300 meters for relaxation and enjoyment. So I give these three examples. They are completely different, but it's an example how it works in Mechelen and I think in all the local uh, cities and governance. And you have to look to the local opportunities to tackle the global warming, energy efficiency and greening our city. To see these opportunities, you see it, it depends not only of ourselves as government or as, uh, as councillor. You have to do this in collaboration with as many local stakeholders and partners as possible. The citizens, the environmental organizations, the entrepreneurs, the experts, and so on. Thank you so much. Very active city. Uh, we, we, can, we learn. Um, very good examples also of citizen engagement. I think this was actually one of a concrete already reply, you know, to the recommendation that we that we just uh, that we just gave. And um, I guess now everyone uh, wants to come to visit Mechelen to see if we can see these three trees, you know, uh, from. Uh... <laughs> it's a very beautiful city, and it's not far away from here. I invite you, everywhere, everyone there. But it's a lot of changing. Oh, I didn't talk about mobility, but we have changed our mobility plan, and uh, it the results are very impressive. We have a, a modal shift at this moment from more than thirty percent from cars to, to bike and, and, and food. So it's, it's, it's all those kind of things are happening now in Mechelen. It's not enough already eh, to, to get to the goals, but uh, it's, 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 it's going better and better. Good, people are encouraged to come now and then in, in five years, so to see the difference as well. <laughs> okay, great, thank you so much. Now, um, I would like to give the floor to Pedro uh, Diaz and, um, Hearing a bit, listening a bit from from you, from from your perspective, also uh, representing uh, industry in providing solar heat solutions. So, how? Um, so, what are your experiences in a way in collaborating with municipalities and and regions in finding clean heating solutions? Uh, how? What, in your perspective, are the opportunities and uh, and the challenges uh, uh, that are? that are there, I mean, in the territories and how can we maybe together, you know, overcome them, uh, but also understanding a bit from you, from your perspective, from the private sector, what is missing in the European Green Deal? You know, what would you, you know, like if you, if you're here, I mean, it's your opportunity as well to address a message to, uh, to, to the commission and, and to all the other members, please. Very good. So, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks, Federica, for for the the question and for the invitation. It's it's a pleasure to be here. I I, I really enjoyed the, the the discussion so far. One positive thing of it is that uh, I, I think many of the points are uh, uh, complementary or even concurring uh, uh, and complementary with ours. Uh, but it also uh, gave me a, a bigger message is uh, what to bring uh, on the table because uh, 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 we, we see similar uh, questions for, to what was already presented. One, um, and, and we're talking about the OECD report and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Matsumoto. I think it's a very interesting work. And one of the challenges, and if I, uh, you are putting as one of the steps the additional data sets and improving the, the data. And if I can uh, give a recommendation, is the part on heating and cooling. And for instance, you talk about, in the report, you're looking to electricity generation, but it's important to look also to heat generation. 
And this is one of the essential elements that is usually forgotten. And, and if I can tell you something that you remember one month from today is that heat is off. Heat is half of the energy consumption in Europe. It, and this is commonly forgotten. When we look into buildings, 80% of the consumption in uh, our, our uh, uh, houses is for heating. Space heating, domestic hot water, 80%. But then when we talk about uh, uh, this transition, we usually talk about electricity. And, and the question is why? And there is a very simple explanation. Uh, and it's something that we need to work together. So when we look into this political dimension, heating is a local issue. It has to be addressed with citizens, it has to be addressed with local authorities. When we go to energy policy, this is usually dealt at, your, at EU level and national level. National governments have competences when it comes to the electricity markets and to the gas markets. So their energy policy and their structure, their experts, the ministries, the directorate generals, the energy agencies are prepared to deal with these issues. So when the minister asks, okay, what do we do for decarbonization? Um, they think electricity and gas and say, okay, now we need to get away from gas. What do we do? Electricity. electricity. And they forgot heat. And then what do we do with heat? Wait, well, we don't know. This is a local issue, but we have electricity here that we know a lot. Let's electrify. It's very simple. It's not their fault. It's how the structure was built. And then when they go to local level, local level say, but we don't have compasses on energy. This is your compass at the national level. You say, yeah, but we don't understand heat. And we, and, and we have this divide. And, and you identify this. In, you, we're talking about the OECD report, which is also very interesting. I got today from you this Powering the Future which is equally interesting, and I, uh, I think it's a congratulate you for this work. You have this. First point on the headlines, improve the quality of national dialogues between national and local level, and, and in, in this case, on energy policy. That is critical. Second question is on data. So OECD, focus on that. Let's, let's take an example, and also what comes from the Green Deal and, and from EU policy. Energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency director, uh, directive included a requirement for comprehensive assessments on heating and cooling demand at local level. It's very disappointing when we look at these comprehensive reports. Some member states did only desk research. They didn't understand the relevance of the data. So if a municipality wants to do a work of planning, how do they deal with their energy parts? They lack the data. And because also at national level, uh, some of them only looked at this as one more annoying uh, requirement from Brussels to do this. They put a couple of people dealing with these comprehensive assessments and they didn't understand the impact that this could have on the energy transition in their countries, starting from the local level. So, it's, it's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the status quo needs to be changed. And for this to change, and for this dialogue to happen, we get to the uh, red line. So again, I'm repeating, but we also found this, which is local authorities need to be empowered. They need to have technical experts uh, that can deal with heat. When we have municipalities, for instance, that are district heating networks, many times they delegate this into the district heating uh, company, the utility that is doing this. Like, okay, you are the guys of the heat, take care of this. But we need more than that. And in many cases, not everything is covered by district heating. District heating in, 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 is, is, is essential part of the solution. But we also have the central, we also have in different homes. Uh, to, to how to promote this and, and get into the citizen engagement that I think we'll discuss later. But local authorities need more resources to do this. So they need more funding to get experts that can come to, the, to get into their teams. And they can help them to look into the reality at local level and to make the most of it. How do they make the energy transition? And just to conclude, I'm getting along. An additional challenge. How resilient is are they in terms of energy supply? Let's, let's talk seriously because we're talking about energy transition decarbonizing, but part of the, the energy transition is about also decentralizing energy supply. And therefore, the question of knowing how much renewable heat is also generated. This is another question. When we talk about uh, renewables, we, we, we know that uh, we have a lot of renewable electricity. Yeah, but we don't have all. It's like 30 something percent of all electricity is renewable. So it's not even half. 
Some countries are, are close to that. But in qualitative terms, in quantitative terms, sorry, we have more renewable heat than most bioenergy. If we have more renewable heat than renewable electricity, we also ignore this fact usually. We think, ah, oh, we have more. No. In terms of less terawatt hours, we have more terawatt hours of renewable heat generated than electricity. We dot all the focus that we've been doing because it's everywhere. It's in, in every city, it's in every uh, place. That we need to generate the heat locally. We, the, even when I just heat, it, it's local. It's, it's for that municipality. And we need to think of the economic value of this. So this is the resilience for comfort for the citizens of having a local supply, uh, um, and in particular in areas that may uh, have a security issue, and with not only security, but the overall is, 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 is a bigger question in, in, in the context we are today. But so the economic value, can we generate value from there? Can we create value for our municipality from energy generation? We have examples like this in Germany, rural areas, where the use for bioenergy for the additional heating because they will use from the farmers around. Uh, we, they can have a cooperation with companies that are working locally, and then part of this energy goes into the investment that's a local investment to have structures with thermal, as Madeleine was saying, or, or solar thermal, as you see in Denmark, Germany. So how can we combine energy transition at local level, heat, making heat a bigger issue, being tackled by municipalities with financing, with uh, expertise internally, and how can also this contribute to the local economy? This is, these are essential challenges. And to make it possible, local authorities need to be more active. They also need to be supported to be, be more active on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, uh, for stressing the importance of looking at eating as one of the, the important aspects for this transition to actually work, but also, you know, to recognize the, the important role of, of local and regional government in all this uh, approach and, and the challenges that they are facing, you know, and, and then looking at also the indicators, the importance of data, you know, to really look into this, this, this to collect them and then use them, you know, properly in that sense. So thank you uh, so much for this, uh, for this perspective. Um, now we uh, come to our our uh, uh, last uh, uh, panelist, uh, so the European Commission, because we on purpose left you at the end. Don't take it personally. It's because we want to actually have the opportunity to showcase a bit of, you know, to, to send a bit of message to, to, to showcase a number of examples, you know, at, at a retail level. And then uh, hear from, from, from you now that you listen also to the number of challenges, uh, the, the experiences uh, in, in the territory, how, you know, uh, the commission being deal is actually addressing some of them. So tell us a bit how we could, uh, in a way, solve some of, of, of our challenges and, um, and also how uh, we could uh, really develop more and more a long-term vision and approach for a more uh, multi-level governance collaboration. So how can we, you know, foster a, a bit more, because this, I think, is one of the of, of really of challenges that we are facing as, as municipalities, regions, really, need, uh, but those from the private sector, we, we heard that we need to foster collaboration. So how uh, you would uh, envisage this uh, possible in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Federica. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a really good and um, insightful um, discussion uh, so far. So um, it's really, um, uh, I don't think I have to make a case of climate action, because all of you are really convinced, beyond doubt. We have a recent uh, report actually from the Commission, uh, the European Climate Risk Assessment, actually by the European Environmental Agency, uh, published last month, that they chose Europe the fastest warming uh, continent in the world. So yes, we need uh, all those, uh, all, all the shade that you can provide at local level, uh, and the wetlands uh, to, to feel um, really relieved. Um, our seas, but of course, this is not enough. We need to, and we will understand here that it is in our absolute self interest uh, to hold this warming <clears throat> as much as possible. We must step our, our risk management mitigation efforts to become climate neutral by 2050. This is why you and member states together have committed into climate law uh, to make uh, Europe first carbon neutral continent. By 2050, and we have adopted this legislation, 55, uh, it sets us on the track to meet targets for 2030, uh, and further on, and we must take the course and uh, focus on its full implementation, as, as we heard. Um, transition to climate neutrality is about securing the prosperity and well-being of, of our citizens uh, now and in the long term. This is really something important to recall. Uh, it also must ensure a fair transition that rests the impacts of the changes on the mass vulnerable. Uh, climate transition is also um, uh, it goes hand in hand with the competitive economy, with quality jobs, and, and the fast growing and zero activity. So we must not forget that this is something that uh, we do also for, for our economy. And then, as has been established here, uh, uh, we all agree that regional local authorities are a key role in making this net transition a reality uh, on the ground and implement sustainable development goals. 
in the larger sense. I mentioned this because I'm actually responsible for the SDGs, so I will talk, talk a little bit about the SDGs. Uh, because implementing the SDGs realizes a system of multiple governance. We are really convinced about it. Of course, what actually is part of that. We presented at the United Nations last summer at the High Level Political Forum, Sustainable Development, the uh, first ever EU voluntary review and SDG implementation, which looked at how the climate action, but also all the other uh, goal goals. And they exemplified their uh, success practice at national level, local level too. Uh, if I remember well, maybe the ship making was also mentioned. But this report in, in Italy was really seen uh, and perceived by everybody uh, globally as, as a really big and celebrated as a very good example of reporting to the UN. And it was also a big part of it, but when we went to the stage there, it was not only a commission and such a chapter, but we also tried to bring together all the institutions of the EU to make the point that we will really take this uh, seriously as a, as a, a systematic, uh, we have a systematic multi-level approach to, to this. And so, uh, the EU supports the organization in various ways, just very briefly, since data was mentioned in the context of the OECD report. Now here I would mention also some efforts from <clears throat> our colleagues in the mission, the JRC department, with the pilot project that they did, uh, and um, concluded in December last year, it was uh, dedicated to monitoring SDG in new regions and exactly filling the data gaps. They uh, had um, 10 regions selected and uh, looked at, at a set of available uh, indicators to, to measure SDGs and climate action with it. And we can see this available work has been carried uh, through. Uh, very nice with these uh, with, uh, with these uh, regions and it, uh, the the finance of indicators they are really uh, helpful to monitor the action of SDGs at regional level and also guide uh, local regional authorities um, with the transition. Another expression of the multi-level approach uh, that um, the Commission uh, takes is our support for the global coalition for high, uh, high ambition multi-level partnerships. It was also something uh, that happened at uh, COP28, and so we uh, for shared objective of promoting. Uh, Collaborate climate action, coordinating between governance levels uh, to help achieve emissions reduction, build resilience, mitigate severe climate impacts. Uh, commission is very much aware of the role of, uh, of local and regional authorities. We, uh, if they're all in supporting the organization uh, and climate resilience efforts, uh, we are helping with uh, initiatives. Many of them as a CITES mission, uh, the, all the adaptation mission, uh, the EU covenant of mayors, we have intelligent systems, and we have smart seas marketplace, civitas, other, we have, of course, the green sea mission. You, you want this. Um, and city responses, all these initiatives show many mayors here are part of the term. Uh, to take lead in the fight against climate change is really important to go even further and further than national governments. The potential impacts of cities is uh, really enormous of the action. For instance, cities participating in the city missions, which represent 12% of Europe's uh, population. They are on the way to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by nearly 200 million tons of carbon equivalent, which is the uh, equivalent of total annual emissions of Netherlands and Croatia combined. At the same time, as we are hearing, of course, uh, uh, city climate plans and investment strategies show that the, the, the scale uh, of need is really huge uh, to, in terms of funding and finance, materials and solutions, services. So, so this need all constitutes a significant demand uh, driver and therefore also a major opportunity for Europe's green industrial transformation. Uh, these urban initiatives be leveraged to accelerate green and digital uh, industrial transition for both large and small companies in Europe and to steer their competitiveness in an increasingly competitive, uh, of course, geopolitical context. Uh, the Commission is working with member states, regions, and municipalities to ensure that green and digital transition and sustainability at large are high on the list of priorities when funding and investment decisions are being made under the longer budget. Uh, because everybody, every municipality um, has, a, has a role to play, big or small, green or poor. Many small efforts can have huge uh, combined impact. And at this level, there are many substantial resources available to cities and local governments to help in this effort, uh, both in the form of technical assistance and direct funding, pointing, of course, on the need for further simplification and uh, see what can be done um, in, uh, in the longer run. First, you know, the EU budget is like this big, and then there is also all Public money in Europe is, is much higher, and then and there's also the need for the private sector to continue to be uh, to, to take leading role in deploying investment in the key transition. From our end, we're also uh, staying up um, very much the um, uh, exchanges, and so the, the uh, trying trying to reach to, uh, as far as possible again uh, to learn about the opportunities and challenges at main level. We've had a, a, a serious clean transition dialogues actually with uh, with the industry representatives, social partners. Uh, one of these dialogues was focused on cities. It placed on the 15th of March, um, and they actually the commission publishes a communication taking stock of of the series of dialogues. And I think it would be interesting uh, for, for you to refer to this. It's probably a matter of hours until we, we publish. <laughs> and since uh, one of the picks of today's discussion is resilience, I would also like to draw your attention on, on another communication we have adopted on the 12th of March, so very recently, on risk management. Um, and again, referring to, to, uh, to this um, uh, report uh, on climate assessment by the EA, um, we know that risks, that, that climate impacts will continue to become more frequent, more severe, and even the best case scenario, we need to prepare for this 3 db warming in Europe. The good news is that risks are manageable if we work together. 
And first and foremost, we really need uh, to be clear about who owns the risk. It is important for everybody, EU members, level, national level, subnational, region, local actors, to know who should act when something uh, needs a public intervention. We also need to ensure that these growing climate risks are taken into account. And to get there, we need to accurately assess uh, the risks that citizens are facing. The mission uh, will improve the range of tools that member states can use to build climate resilience at all levels and in all sectors. And uh, of course, we must uh, also see the economic side. It is really good economic practice that has good return. Uh, one euro invested in prevention can save up to 14 euro in repairs, studies show. And therefore, um, we need to make sure that the risks are not long, not long underpriced in economic policy decisions. It's also based on private investment, public budget, and policy designs. Therefore, we need to factor all these in, in our um, decisions uh, the benefit of our long-term sustainability of our economies. Um, thank you for your attention and <laughs> ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for mentioning a number of really very important and effective uh, initiatives at sea level. The covenant, we know. Uh, and we are very much involved in it, but city missions as well, and many, many others. Um, also, thanks for taking into consideration, you know, uh, all our, let's say, us and points, uh, and uh, uh, those con including, you know, the, the importance of stressing more and enhancing more multi-level governance co collaboration. Um, and, uh, and also to remind us on uh, this, the importance of the of uh, dialogues and, uh, and also moving, you know, uh, towards uh, this with concrete steps. I think the clean transition dialogue is indeed one of the uh, an important step in the sense. Now I'm, I'm aware of the time uh, that is passing so fast. Um, so uh, I would like to give the floor first of all to, to our participants in, uh, here in the room and, and online for some uh, questions um, to then move maybe to a, a, a final uh, round of, of questions to. To, to wrap up before giving floor so to uh, uh, Maria uh, Colton for, for her uh, including remarks. Um, please, questions from, from the floor. Yes, please. Yeah, hello, good morning. My name is Rochefika from the Association of German Cities, a member of CMR. Uh, I was very uh, intrigued by uh, your presentation uh, about the territorial approach and um, um, we have in Brussels at the moment uh, very discussion how to proceed, for example, with the cohesion in the next uh, in the next uh, um, uh, mandate. Um, and uh, also, uh, we are in we live in a town in Brussels where sexual lobbyists, sorry, have a lot of influence on on how European legislations are shaped. So, uh, for example, team up in there for the next mandate, they, they are asking for a commission on territorial matters. Uh, on my association, as one on urban matters, however, <laughs> we find maybe someone who uh, could uh, address uh, on EU legislations this point on what does the impact, what effect will it have on, on territory, whatever you do on legislate, sectoral legislation. What do you think that would be helpful, such having such a go-to guy for uh, for regions and, and, and cities in the commission, but also having someone in the commission uh, looking at the impact closer on what it means for the territory approach. And uh, so, Mr. Diaz, uh, I have one question to you. Um, we have, if you screen through the EP uh, election campaigns, for example, from us, from Ms. van der Leyen, it all points a bit to what we're going to an industrial um, uh, and still market uh, uh, perspective, so closer to the industry, to businesses. And uh, I think business groups yesterday launched uh, something like Reboot Europe. Um, but this seems to go in a way towards the central pro. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, how do you see, since you're representing the industry, and uh, are you actually uh, willing to go into the sector and approach, or are you also seeing benefit having a more territorial integrated approach? Because uh, uh, you mentioned heat, and uh, as a city representative, the heat transformation will become a very uh, important issue for, for this in Germany, but to bring this in synergies with other infrastructures, public infrastructures they have to manage. So that would be my question. Thank you so for my first question. Um, so you specifically mentioned the EU decision, and uh, but that uh, also uh, my, my answer would also be applied to the international context. You know? So um, the report actually really tried to, to address that point. You know? So the sector ministry or sector director right now in the organization institution and then the client institution and then the territorial development institutions there. So our approach is first of all, uh, if you have a climate sector, yes, or climate uh, disease, for example, is equipment there. Uh, so, so this place is in charge of climate policy as a whole, right? And then, you know, our uh, argument is that they tend to be rather sexual or not not enough taking into account of the local condition. So our key message is that, yes, uh, incorporate 
the territory they are brought into those major climate legislation. So that's one point. So that's also up to the UN you know, global discussion as well. At the same time, let's see, uh, in the case of EU, there are DG region and, and also other places where you know, discussing uh, education, discussing uh, reform, and, re you know, this. and then we are trying to say that mainstream, mainstreaming climate issues into each of these let's say sectors, including, of course, uh, at uh, territorial development. That is, as the goal, important. And then, you know, uh, at, a, at, a le at a legislative level as well, you know, so recognizing climate as a main or at least a, a major objective of these, you know, places. Uh, and then in cooperation with this, uh, you know, this, uh, incorporating a, a territorial approach into climate policies altogether, you know, create some coherence across. Yeah, so that's our, our emphasis. Thank you. Better. Okay. Uh, sorry, you know, right, to, to see if it can be clear on, on, on the way to put it. The, the two needs to be, be combined. Uh, the things go together. And, 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 and let's and I say this, uh, uh, let's put it in practice on, on specific cases. One of the issues with the European industry is loss of, loss of competitiveness and the localization. So, I have a huge competition from the US with IRA uh, uh, tracking a lot of investments, working in a new reindustrialization in the US and put a lot of money on it, which is very attractive for many companies. We have also the question of uh, energy prices, and it's getting better because uh, the reduced our dependency from Russia, uh, uh, we had to rush into deals for the supply of, of LPG, for instance, which means that we are stuck with prices that are not going back to what were before. But to do this, we need to find solutions for industry so it can be competitive and can remain in Europe. And this has to be done also by the, 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 the solution for the energy supply, again, heat being 60%, process heat. It is more than 60% of the industrial energy consumption. The process heat is 60% of the energy consumption industry. So again, the issue is heat. So let's talk about the main issue and look for strategies for this. You want to, your industry to remain. Again, how can we help them to find a, a, a competitive and predictable supply? Renewable heat can do this. You can do this with geothermal, you can do this with solar thermal, you can do with bioenergy. Bioenergy and heat pumps fluctuations because bioenergy also depend on the cost of the bioenergy you are using. Uh, heat pumps depend on the cost of electricity, but um, they also allow to have com competitive and stable air prices. And even more, companies that are willing to do this, they have support from the national level, from uh, uh, local regional governments, uh, they will stay there because if they're investing to create conditions, they are committing to stay. It's a work that has been done together. So I don't see question of sectoral territorial, they, they go together, they have to go together. They own, that discussion only exists, again, when we have a economy that energy is electricity and gas, and it's European and national level. When we really want to make a transition, look to the depth of the things, they intersect. That's, for me, that's what's straightforward, I'd say. Thank you. Um, Simona, uh, you have a question? Actually, I don't have questions. I have three parts to my intervention here. One is a, a compliment, the other one is a critique, and then the third one is uh, some additions to what the colleague from the private sector said. I represent Austrian cities here in Brussels, and uh, my name is uh, Simona. The compliment is when the Commission unleashed the Green Deal tsunami, we were quite flaggarded by sheer amount and detailed uh, proposals. And uh, small associations, we didn't think we could uh, work with these proposals at all. So it was mostly because of our colleague on the CMR Green team uh, that we could, in the end, face um, uh, writing up amendments and kind of uh, finding out what the Commission actually meant with um, many, many proposals. And we did think that the Commission actually tried to get in contact with local governments before it, um, Mr. Um, Timmermans, who has left the Commission now, actually unleashes his proposals. So thank you very, very much to our colleagues from the CMR team. Uh, second, uh, a critique. Um, we didn't really need the Commission to tell the local government how to adapt uh, to climate, climate change. We, uh, you know, the, the citizens push city governments, city politicians who act. They are usually much more informed than we probably can ever be. So it was a little, um, yeah, without discussing with us, uh, just to put all those uh, legal proposals on us, was quite, initiatives was quite strong. Um, when it comes to specific areas, as the, the, the colleague from the um, private sector said, I just want to point out that data collection and storage in Austria is done 95% by the local level, so it's us. 
And of course, data storage collection and keeping them up to date is very expensive. It needs uh, personnel, it needs a lot of finances, etc., etc. But here as well, the Commission uh, said uh, you have to uh, offer your data for free. Uh, you can charge when you want to sell them. You cannot do anything. So data has to be available for everybody, even for huge big companies that don't even pay any taxes in Europe, for example, which to us was uh, incomprehensible. To give data to Austrian citizens who pay with the, with the money to have good environmental data is no problem, and also to Austrian companies. And that was always a, 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 an agreement between the private sector and the public sector. And then concerning um, critique, I forgot, I, I wanted to mention to Commission that some of its proposals are absolutely incompatible. It's one, one department from Commission uh, designs or proposes something, and it seems sometimes to us, even the legal language, it's not compatible. It says something different than other uh, departments of the Commission proposes. What, uh, what they say in, uh, for example, public procurement doesn't always add up what the environmental DG suggests. It's, uh, it's this difference in, in, in language, it's something in the legal text that doesn't really add up many, many times. Um, and uh, concerning strict heating, as the, the colleague from the private sector again said, it's um, Austrian cities are quite uh, known for the district heating, so how to use heat. So, it's all very well, but in the end, we miss from the Commission talking to us first before they unleash all that. And when it comes to implementation, it seems that not only national civil servants are kind of, uh, yeah, don't really know how to help the local level to implement their, all those, those different lead proposals. Energy efficiency is very, very difficult. People just don't know how to interpret what the Commission actually meant by it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Someone wants to respond? I, I, I don't know if she wants to reply, but I, uh, I, uh, I will take a bit of an uh, intermediate role here. Um, and, and, and then I'll ask Lucia for a coffee for this. Um, Simon, let, let, let me give you a quick example. And, and, and leave me, uh, Austria is, uh, I personally can't feel personally like very much, but it's also one of the main, our main countries for solar thermal. So we might not know, but the, the the country with more solar thermal capita in Europe is Cyprus. The second is Austria, and one of the largest manufacturers in the world of solar thermal is in Austria. They have the relevant to us, and, and Austria is a country that has a strong role in terms of renewals. But for instance, you, you will will surely know this: Austria did not have plan for heating and cooling. It has been worked, and it has been worked because for national energy climate plan, because in the directions the Commission gave. It was essential to cover heating and cooling in national energy climate plan because the Commission also identified that at the policy scale at the national level, there was this gap because this was a local issue. They had more. They had a comprehensive assessment, as I mentioned before, on the energy efficiency directive, again, to push the national governments to get closer to the needs of the local governments. They have the requirement of the consultation with local level. With some countries put the tick, but they didn't do a comprehensive work on this. So I think. Uh, 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 it's not the uh, Commission says everything well, though. The Commission is, com is a complex machine with many parts of this machine. So uh, it's, it's not that uh, everything is well. But I think we are in a tough position there because it's our subsidiarity. But so we, as a as colleague from, from Mechen said, you know, the microclimate is not only between uh, a city center and, and the city and, and the wetlands. It's also in, in, the, in, in the member states, between the national government and the city governments. Usually the cities are much, much more advanced and the national government are much more reserved and, and conservative. So we miss that commission does really act on that and say, look, Austria, you have to design this plan. Go and talk to your, to your and I know the commission says, well, our, our adversary is only the member state. But, I feel I have to give the floor to the commission in all this. To... Please, would, would you like to? Here to everybody that commission is, uh, but it is uh, in charge of trying to, to shape and to represent uh, European interests. Uh, it is one of the other missioners that unleashes uh, things on the rest of European citizens. Uh, it is a, a college that makes decisions, makes proposals, and proposals are normally uh, well, well researched, well thought through, well, well uh, designed, and in cooperation with stakeholders. Uh, our state of the art decision making is really uh, something that everybody's <laughs> in agreement with that. Uh, when the Commission proposes something, you have all these possibilities to listen to stakeholders, take all opinions into account, something that. Member states and the council don't really do. So I think we cannot really fault for that. 
and ultimately uh, let's remember what happens with legislation. Uh, it's a proposal. We consider that proposal represents and helps European interest, and we have legislators. Legislators are really the ones taking the decision. Everything that you mentioned was approved by all the member states and by the European Parliament, and we think that uh, it is a very uh, useful platform for all these proposals. So people are in agreement, all the institutions represent the present European interests here, uh, including those that represent uh, local authorities, are keen to uh, move on. And we, we, what we see is that people really want more ambitious climate action. And um, yeah, from our perspective, we are the role of the Secretary General in the Commission is to ensure um, them. Um, the fact that uh, these body of uh, proposals are coherent from another. So, indeed, I, I think that we were trying to do our job in making uh, all proposals as easy as, as possible. But again, you know very well uh, that there is all this ecosystem that I that mentioned. So, um, I think that um, we, uh, we are on the good track. We are also listening more, more and more with the, all the dialogues that we're setting, with the very active social dialogue that we're supporting. Um, so, yeah, to, to close, I would like to just uh, invite you to read the communication that comes out today on the clean transition network. Maybe they will also provide answers to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, a f I'm, yes. Um, from local perspective, as other man, a little city, eh? not a big city like you know, or I don't know where, but um, I think we need the EU for the legislation for setting the goals. I have much more problems as local city with the national and Belgium is very complex. I have to be five uh, ministers of climate and so on, so it's not easy. Eh? Uh, but because we have the clear goals from the EU, we always can refer to the EU. If yesterday there was a con uh, you have the, also the, the legislation and you have the, the, the card, eh? the European card, who took a very important decision yesterday. They made, they, they closed the gap between the citizens of the EU and all the governments, also national governments. With the condemnation they, they had yesterday, it's very, very important. And the thanks of the European, ID. I don't say it's thanks of the EU, but without the EU, never, not local, would reach the goals in every city of the EU, in every local government. It's very, very important. It's not perfect, no, because I have also a lot of critics. But what's, what's the alternative at this moment? With, with uh, so much regions, with so much lands huh, in it, in a global uh, world, you need the EU and that kind of legislation to have a clear goal, to have a clear action plan. And I'm completely with you. Uh, you have to focus on the heat. It's more important than, than other things. But not only on the heat, also on the consumption. Creating production, uh, circular economy, it's 50% of all our energy consumption. Eh? It's also heat, but it's also electricity. We, we nearly talked about it, but it's it's so important to, to reach that goal eh? for climate neutral, fossil free in, in Europe and the world also. And we, I, I'm i glad we have the EU with all that clear uh, yeah. proposals. I think we all uh, agree on the importance of the European Union, and that's more into when we come to practice and then. Uh... To, to see how then uh, but it is easy to have critic. We have to, uh, it's, it's, we don't have the time to have all the time to have critics of the EU. We now have to act. <laughs> it's like the, it's a bit like the youngster from climate and also the elders from climate they say now. Don't stop the stop the discussion. What is the best? We don't have the time to discuss about that. That's my local <laughs> idea about Thanks it. Thanks for the, the... Yeah, perfect. You know, um, um, we are running extremely late, but we still have questions also from the online. Would you like to give the opportunity to the poll connected online to, um, to pose a question? Um, do we have, uh, can you please tell me who is, uh, Andreas? Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Keep it um, short. Thank you. I'll try. <laughs> I'm with the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. Um, uh, thanks for a very illustrative uh, discussion. Uh, one point um, about what I think needs to be done. We have showed a lot of what can be done locally and the need for a uh, territorial approach along with a sectorial uh, approach. And I think one important thing, seeing that there are many cities wanting to become climate neutral 2030 and so, is also to demonstrate what local authorities cannot do. <laughs> uh, that need also needs to be done in this approach, seeing that they not have the legal framework, they do not uh, sort of command the intercity transport system, the industrial uh, system and the need for structuring, because they're really left with the emissions uh, of transport of industry. Yes, the uh, energy system you could do locally, but you cannot do the intercity transport, you cannot do the industry, uh, you cannot do you, the, the carbon use and, and storage. 
So uh, I think one point with this uh, framework that you're, uh, that you're showing is also to show the limits. So the cities don't feel left alone with trying to fix things they cannot fix. So, uh, and, and thirdly, also, so you have to show on the, at the same time, you to show the territorial approach, you have to show the limits of it and what you, with the governments. And also, the, as has briefly mentioned, this is the personal responsibility of citizens. It's really consumption. I mean, that's the big thing that you could so easily cut emissions, but it has to do with lifestyles and those difficult questions. But you have to show who is responsible for what. So that's what I would like to be sort of clarified. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also, thanks for not posing a question, but, but having a comment and my recommendations from your side. Thanks, uh, Andres. So I would like now to uh, conclude the session, giving the floor to Marina Overton, councillor in Nicholshire County Council in UK and CMR spokesperson for climate. Uh, before giving the floor to uh, Marina Overton, I would like to take opportunity to thank you all, uh, all the, the panelists, but also all the uh, participants to this, uh, to this session. It was uh, really inspiring, I think, and uh, definitely important to have the discussion uh, that it's uh, and it's going to continue of course uh, but yeah the floor is yours for your closing remarks thank you thank you very much indeed for an excellent discussion and presentations which i found really helpful um firstly i just have to uh, introduce myself i'm marianne marianne Overton. i'm also vice chairman of the local government association in for england and we also cover wales so we have uh, we're very keen to be supported and engaged so thank you very much certainly the legislation that comes from europe we are trained to make sure that England does at least as well, if not better. And this certainly that is a very uh, hard uh, battle for us too. I was pleased to see the figures for London appeared quite low on the OECD, but for me, they're nothing like good enough. I think you probably feel similarly. And I was a bit, um, well, it's realistic, I understand, but from the European, uh, specs, uh, the EU spokesperson, who is Luciane, uh, uh, Lucian, to say that the temperature rises we are expecting to be at least three percent which have you know i thought i had hoped we were still working towards one and a half degrees sorry one and a half degrees rise and to just accept a three degrees rise um is a shame it's disappointing but i understand that they may be realistic so just to pick up some of the issues firstly to say um clearly one size is not fit to all and it's fantastic to hear the EU commission has supported such a vast range of successful local government initiatives and that starts to really demonstrate the link that we are looking for between the international and national ambition being actually delivered locally, largely by our local uh, uh, municipalities and regions. So the important point also I wanted to pick up was to say that the local government, I picked up from Mr. Matsumoto, about the local government has power. We have significant influence and it's really important that we use it. We do need funding and we need to get those from the different Sources. And the cheapest form of power is to use less. Picking up Andreas's comment about consumption is also something we should not entirely forget. I really appreciated uh, Pedro Das's point about the heat being so vital. Clearly, that is direct energy it has had to be transferred into another kind and therefore is more efficient. And I think that's a really strong point and also picked up by Simone, which I'm really pleased to. I think we need to do a lot more on that. And thank you for the three excellent examples from Patrick Prison about the city, uh, Mission City, which is nearby. Um, that was really inspiring, much appreciated. And I think those are really useful for us. Definitely all want to come visit. The point from Michael was very much about uh, Michael Perez, about taking the people with us. Absolutely. I think we're all very much aware that we cannot succeed if we cannot take the public with us. It is clearly a team effort. Then I just wanted to pick up some of the recommendations from the legislative mandate. There are four main recommendations that CMR has put together. Um, firstly, I think we need to accelerate the implementation. And for that, we do need flexible guidance tools and we need to gather feedback so that we can make revisions and improvements continually. The resource allocation, we need to continue to advocate for significant resources. The calculations in my council are huge and the amount of money that we'd really need if we really could make sure that every house was retrofitted, for example. But we need to find ways of doing things that cost less as well as getting further income in. And it's the funding of the projects is absolutely essential and they do inspire other people to bring in funding as well. And I liked the point that was made about the different bodies being brought together, so many different organisations that we need to engage and bring them in towards our joint combined success. And that's why the local engagement remains so important. 
and it's absolutely vital that our local governments who are closest to people and therefore most able to engage, encourage, inspire, listen, and to actually bring those changes on a much wider, uh, wider arena. And last of all, is looking beyond the EU borders. And we talked about um, some other countries that bring in some further suggestions and indeed the way as well, but looking outside the EU as well as inside the EU for really good ideas when it comes to adaptation and cooperation for the knowledge and inspiration that we're looking for. Um, a call to action. I think what we've seen today is a very clear call to action. It is urgent, it is an emergency, and we do need to do our utmost with getting everybody on board to actually make the changes are essential for our future. Reference to yesterday's uh, leg legislative decision, I think it's really important to have to agree. Um, it's the where the Swedish women took the, the government to court because of their own human rights in that they would be impacted by climate change. And that going, if that continues uh, across many countries, that's going to be a really important step that we're going to need to, a stick that we're going to need to really step up our game. The, it also brings with EU elections coming up. I'm really pleased about governance, the human rights and subsidiarity and sustainability. Those are going to be really key issues, I'm sure, coming up in elections. And I'm really glad that we'll be able to speak up locally about um, just how much we can do and how much is needed. It also brings a, a move towards a digital transition um, to make sure that we've got local, uh, um, rural and urban areas brought together so that we can make sure that we are all working together on the wider scale. And lastly, um, just to consider some next steps, if I might, I uh, invite you to continue to be engaged with the CMR. I'm really pleased that we are working currently in a study on the implementation of the Green Deal and the future of Green Transition to be published in autumn. And this report examines the perception of the climate, how people see it, and the environment policies, at both at local and regional levels, and will highlight challenges and concrete examples of multi-level governance, bringing the improvements we need. And we'll draw on some political recommendations that we'll hand over to the new MEPs and the College of Commissioners in the first weeks of that mandate. So I anticipate launching that study to the public in November, and we'll look forward to your participation in its uh, development as well as its launching. So thank you very much indeed uh, to our, our organisers today and all of the staff who have done such a great job putting things together. A uh, huge thank you and thank you for leadership and thank you for your work that you continue to do in your communities. I look forward to improving an ever greater success. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maria Norton. Thank you and thank you all again. And uh, now coffee time. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.